Uh, hi everyone. Uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, Chong Wu from uh, Light, uh, the Litecoin team, Litecoin, and I'm the blockchain developer of uh, Litecoin team, and I develop our uh, blockchain, Litecoin chain, and also the transaction indexer for Litecoin chain, which uh, is backed by Postgres. And uh, during the development and involvement of uh, the transaction index, uh, I have uh, met some interesting cases in these two years, and I would like to share them with you. So, so the Litecoin chain transaction index uh, is something very simple. It's just something uh, conceptually. It's just something that uh, for every ten seconds, it just gets new transactions from the blockchain. And then for each transaction, it just uh, put them into the Postgres database, as simple as this. So for the SQL schema simplified, uh, we define them. Uh, it, we define the schema like this. First, we have an ID for each row for each transaction, and also we also have events so that we can search, say, uh, search for all transactions sent from one account. And for Every other things we simply put put them into a data structure called JSON B in Postgres. So we know we know JSON, uh, JavaScript object notation. We use them very uh, a lot, but JSON B was that. In short, uh, JSON B is a Postgres uh, version of JSON, uh, which is uh, which is JSON, but in binary formats. Therefore, it's stored in binary. It's more efficient, and most importantly, it supports indexing. Or uh, of the JSON fields, therefore it's very useful. So in short, uh, binary JSON in high performance and in with index support. So we are using Postgres, a traditional SQL database. Why don't we define it in a traditional way? Define many columns for each uh, for each uh, field in the JSON and then store them inside. That's because uh, when finding stuff in JSON, it's much simpler. Uh, it's as simple as uh, pulling the transaction data from Chain API, which returns JSON, and then blindly puts everything, this JSON, into the database. As simple as that. We don't need to define columns. We don't need to pass the JSON express fields, put them one by one in uh, matching the columns in the schema. And with this, we can develop much faster, and things are much simpler. Also, since JSON is schemaless, uh, when there are software upgrades in the chain, for example, the underlying SDK upgrade and then add new fields like uh, transaction tips, then we automatically support them uh, seamlessly because everything, uh, every newly added things are returned in the chain API in JSON and they are all, all stored in Postgres. And it also supports uh, quite much operations. For example, we can Get a deep inside the object. We can query all. Uh, we can query all messages deep inside the transaction body, and then pass them into array or uh, to do further processing using uh, SQLs uh, extension from Postgres. And the performance is also acceptable because we, uh, as mentioned before, it supports indexing. So, for example, we build an index. Uh, by the transaction hash field in the object, we can even choose to use hash index. Therefore, it search uh, could be even faster. So we can search from millions of transactions uh, according to transaction hash in sub-millisecond time. So everything is great. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, things are simple, right? The concepts are simple. Cooks are they are just less code. So things run well uh, for more than a year. And then something weird happened. Uh, this is Postgres uh, error data from the Postgres database uh, stating that there is a uh, invalid syntax for JSON, which is weird because we don't do much. We just simply crawl from chain API and then put the what is returned from the chain right into the Postgres database. The chain must return a valid JSON API a valid JSONs uh, is backed by the SDK uh, audit by many people. And when we dive deep into the details of this era, uh, we, f we see something called surrogate, which is related to Unicode. And we have no idea what's that. What, what's that and what's its relationship with JSON and what's this era? So after some investigation, I found that surrogate in short, uh, some hacky solution 
by UTF-16 encoding. In uh, the price paid by them for an underestimation of the growth in characters, which is, well, weird. Uh, let me explain some history. When uh, we have computer, we need to store some characters. At first, we have ASCII, which stores numbers, stores characters, stores symbols. It uses seven bits of uh, of you. It uses seven bits to encode every characters, which seems enough. But then we have CJK characters, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean characters, which I have. We have thousands of them. Then ASCII is not enough, and then we have UTF-16, which is to use to okay now one byte is not enough to encode all these characters so we use two bytes per character to encode things two bytes is 16 bits so you have 16 so it can encode more than 65,000 different combinations should be more than enough but then things grow and we have emoji we have other languages we have something or even something called control sequences defined in unicode the unicode is updating updating so now things are not enough to you, even uh, even two bytes are not enough. And at last, we have UTF-8, which is uh, kind of a standard now, which is a variable length encoding. But unfortunately, at that time, Java and later JavaScript and later JSON, which is from Java, which, uh, which is from JavaScript, all are using UTF-16 already. Therefore, we need uh, some kind of solution for encoding things that can't be encoded in two bytes in UTF-16. And the solution from UTF-16 is to, okay, now per unit, we have two bytes per unit, and one unit is not enough. So we have, we use two units, so totally four bytes kind of, to encode these extra stuff. So that should be enough. These two two bytes units are the zero gate pairs. So when we encode a string in JSON, we can, uh, if your JSON is stored in UTF-8, then you can say you want to encode the string ngo, wo, which is me in Chinese character. Then you can simply type the string ngo into that and, and store them into JSON, it's valid. But if you, 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 can, you want to use, say, pure ASCII, which cannot store this string uh, directly, then we can encode them into uh, UTF-16 has, uh, has a decimals. Uh, for example, the uh, the character ngo has the Unicode. Oh, sorry, the Unicode of for uh six two one one in has the decimals. Therefore, we can encode them in backslash u for uh six two one one. So uh, as you can see, uh, we I define two strings. Uh, one is using the UTF sixteen, another is using uh, native encoding. They are different strings. But after passing in JSON, they are the same string. Therefore, in JSON, these two are actually representing the same string as the same character. So for emoji, uh, it's the same story, but emoji are added later in Unicode. Therefore, we need to use something called, uh, you need, we need to use the surrogate pair, which is to split the encoding into two Uni, uh, UTF-16 units, which is split into a uh, DH3D, DCCD, and then encode them into JSON. Uh, sorry, my, okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, as you can see, uh, the same as before, these two uh, strings are different. But they are uh, after passing in JSON, they represent the same emoji, which is this uh, I don't know red light bulb or control, I don't know. So now we have a question. Uh, we have two Unicode, uh, two UTF sixteen sequences units for one character. So what if we only have one of them? Is it still a valid character? Is it a half character or thing or things like that? So. Uh, Unfortunately, the uh, JSON specification does not define if it's valid or not. It just defines the syntax of using this special U to encode UTF-16 sequences. So it's up to the implementation to decide if whether if it's valid or not. And some of the implementation, like Go, which our blockchain is based on, or Node.js and Python says that, OK, it's OK to pass this JSON uh, without any error. 
some other implementation I've tested Ruby and more importantly, post the JSON parser of Postgres says, no, it's not acceptable, it's a syntax error. And this difference in behavior causes our problem. If we look at the transaction, that problematic transaction, uh, is a JSON object of uh, some metadata of an article on a platform called Matters. And in the description field, uh, is it is cut by uh, its suffix is dot dot dot, so it's some uh, some kind of summary of the content. And the uh, and there is a Unicode uh, UTF sixteen sequence here, which is the first half of an emoji here which causes our problem because Postgres doesn't think that is a valid JSON. So the whole story is like that. First, someone posted a post with emoji onto the platform. And then there is a bot automatically crawl po new poses from this platform and extract content metadata from that and put them into our blockchain. The description field of the content metadata is cut from the main text, say the first 15, uh, 50 characters. And the cut is coincidentally right between a uh, surrogate pair. So only half of the surrogate pair is sent onto the blockchain in JSON format. The blockchain accepted that because the blockchain is written in Go. Our indexer crawl this trans transaction. Our indexer think that it, there's no problem because the indexer is also written in Go and then put them into Postgres. And the Postgres think it's not a valid JSON causing the error. And our application stuck there. So now we know that there are some invalid JSON, is some invalid JSON and Postgres is rather strict or robust depending on your, your point of view. So how do we solve the problem? Unfortunately, there is no uh, parameters that we can tune to tune this behavior. So we can only do that by ourselves. We sanitize, we write a program around 100 lines to sanitize the JSON, a small JSON parser, tokenizer, whatever, to par uh, to sanitize and remove those invalid backslash, invalid uh, surrogate pair, uh, dangling surrogate units in the JSON before we pass them into the database. That's our solution on this problem. So yeah, to save some effort, we, we got some trouble and need to write more codes on that. That's the story. So the indexer continues to be involved. As you can see before, uh, we can put some article metadata onto the blockchain. We want to index them specifically so that we can say search by uh, uh, article authors, search by article keywords. So we add indexing on that. And the schema is defined like this. Uh, for each article, uh, we still have article ID as the primary key. And we have some metadata like title, descriptions, and authors, and also tags, which are the keywords of this article defined by the author. So we want to be able to search by author, so we have an index on the author field. For tags, we want to do some more because we want to search not only by one tag, but also multiple tags. For example, I want to search all articles related both po to po both Postgres and HKOS con so that someone can search by talk. So to support this, we use something called a gene index, which is, uh, stands for generalized inverted index in Postgres, which is a very powerful and advanced index, supporting not only uh, string comparisons, but also something like array inclusions. So we can write the query as uh, to search all articles where the text in, uh, completely includes, is a superset of this array containing these two keywords. So in this sense, uh, we can uh, search by variable length of uh, text. Uh, our API also supports limited uh, pagination uh, and the page size is set by the user. Therefore the user can choose to have 100 entries per page, which is the default or less. So one day I'm, cu I'm curious if uh, someone has written article about me so I search the keyword Chong Wu. Since I only want to know if they exist or not, I want to uh, a true or false thing. I don't want to get all the articles about it. So I set the pagination to one, thinking that it could be, it should be faster, right? Okay, 
because I'm now getting less than, I'm not getting 100 of them, I only ask for one of them. It should be faster. And real things happened again. When I set the page, uh, page size to one, it takes around two seconds to run the whole query, which is not slow, but definitely sensible. And well, if I don't set this page size, I use the default 100, the whole thing runs nearly instantly uh, in milliseconds, actually less than milliseconds, which is counterintuitive because when I ask for Postgres to query for less things, it runs slower. It, do, it does more job, but why? Where, what's the difference? I tell you to do less and you do more. What's the extra effort here? So I an, try to analyze this problem. One looks like but powerful tool in Postgres uh, is explain analyze, which will give you both the query plan, which is the uh, how the database is going to execute this query, which index is using, which order is executing, et cetera, et cetera. And the analyze part will ex actually execute the query and give you real data. For example, it will give you the estimation of number of rows in the query plan. After the real execution, it will give, give you the actual data during execution. So when running explain analyze on the query with one, uh, 100, 100 uh, the default limit 100, things are very fast. You can see the execution time is actually 0 0.07 milliseconds. Things are very fast, and that's because it's using index scan, which is, uh, well, utilizing the index. It's used something called bitmap index scan, which help, which is using the index to help indicating the location of the matching rows. Think, so things are very fast. When the limit is set to one, that's another story. When the limit is set to one, suddenly Postgres is, do real things, it do something called a sequential scan, which means that it doesn't use the index. Instead, it goes to the main table and search one by one, go through the whole table to try to search for one matching row, which takes nearly two seconds for execution. So we know that the behavior of Postgres are different, but why? One thing you can, we can notice is that when doing the sequential scan, the blue part is the estimated number of rows, which is a little bit more than 10,000. And the actual, and after the actual one, the actual result is zero because no one no writes article about me. There's no article existing with this tag. So this different, great difference in estimation makes the difference. So we can see that it filtered out all the 5 million rows or in the, in the table, a full table scan, which means that there are 5 million rows in the table. And Postgres thinks that there could be, there should be 10,000 rows matching. So if you do the calculation, that means Postgres thinks that every, uh, there should be a one matching row per 500 rows. So how the Postgres, how the Postgres query planner thinks is that, okay, by some estimation, I think I can get one matching result after, after scanning for 500 rows. Since the rows are small, they, are all, they should be all in one block, 4K, usually 4KB of uh, space inside the disk. So I only get, need to get one block in order to get one matching row, and then I can return that row. So a full table scan, uh, so a sequential scan should be very fast because it only needs to get one block. Getting one block is basically the fastest thing you can do. Uh, in, uh, yeah. So it tries to do, do a sequential scan, but when doing execution, it get one block, scan that, and found nothing. Get another block, scan that, found nothing. Again and again, until it scans the whole table and found that, oh, there is no, there is no matching rows. So it scans through the whole table. When the limit is set to 100, that's another story because 500 rows for one matching row, which means uh, 50,000 rows for 100 matching results. Therefore, it needs to get more row, uh, more blocks from the from the disk, at least more than 10, uh, tens of rows, uh, tens of blocks from disk. So the query planner would think, 
okay, in this in this sense, I would rather use the gene index because although the gene index is complex, more complex, more complicated, it it still costs less than this uh, getting five uh, fifty thousand rows. Therefore, it goes through the gene index for the lookup and everything. Okay, and found nothing in the matching. Found no matching rows. Matching rows. So how do we solve this behavior? How do we fix this? One thing we can do is to disable tell Postgres to disable sequential scan so that it don't do sequential scan. We can see that after doing so, when we set the limit to one and disable sequential scan, it do utilize the index and, this, uh, and the execution time is fast. But we don't do that on production. Because query in pro production are much, much more complex. It could be 10, uh, 20, 30 lines of SQLs. In the whole query, some, maybe in some places, in some position, it, it's faster to use se uh, sequential scan. We think that, uh, so we don't, we think that disabling sequential scan completely for the whole query is not acceptable. So we, instead we use a hacky solution. We set the limits always to 100 for this query. And then do the filtering on the application side. Yeah, and this behavior depends on the data set, size of the data set. Uh, when our data set reach around 10 million, uh, this behavior is, uh, is gone. Uh, so it uses the index, index mode, no matter how we set the page size. So we don't hard code that hard code thing into the code because things will change. So the story continues. Now we support something like tipping, tipping, tipping the articles. So we can pay for the articles. Actually, in production, it's some kind of NFT, but less uh, less complicated. But so assume it's tipping. So for the schema, we define the uh, each tip events, the timestamp, the article ID, which is conceptually a foreign key to the articles, and also the count for each tip. And we also build an index uh, specifically for what we want to do, want to query. Uh, we will talk about that later. So our target is to build a dashboard that I'm an author. So when going into this dashboard, I can see all my articles. And for each article, I want to see the uh, latest five tips for my articles, because there could be thousands of tips for my articles, hopefully. I don't want to. I don't want to show all of them. I just want the latest ones. So we try to write SQL for that. First, we we try a simpler version for one specific article. We query for uh, the latest five tips, which is easy because uh, ID is auto increment. Therefore, larger ID means uh, later tips. Therefore, we search for articles where the tip uh, article ID is specified. And then we search for tips ordered by the tip IDs in descending order, and we got, get the top five results. This is very, very fast, some millisecond. It's, and it's doing something called an index-only scan backwards. Because we define the index uh, like this, first article ID, and then ID, and then value. We define them in this order. So in the index, uh, all the all the entries for article one are grouped together, and then for article two, article three, four, five, six, go go on and go on. So we want when we search for say, for example all the articles for uh, article ID one, we can look uh, we can only look we can simply look into the region of article ID one, and then within this region things are ordered by tip ID, and we want to order by ID. Therefore, things are already ordered. So we do a backward scan from, from backward to forward, and then we can get the five results from this region to get the top five, uh, to get the tips with top five tip IDs. So things are very fast because it doesn't even touch the main table or everything's uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the index. So that's for one specific article. Let's expand that for all articles from say author one. So we try to expand that. We put the original query into a subquery, ST. And then in the outer query, we select all articles from uh, author one. It doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Because we referred to ta uh, the table A, we refer to articles 
uh, article IDA uh, in the outer query. And the order of execution of subquery is as follows. First, the subquery is executed and stored inside a temporary table. And then the outer query executes to query from that table, join from that table. Therefore, when the subquery executes, you don't have the outer table, you don't have article IDs because it's not executed yet. Therefore, you we can't do this. So this doesn't work, so we search for solutions online. And it tells you to use something called a window function, defining the row number, partition by article ID, and then in this partition, we order by tips ID in descending order. And then we do the filtering. So yeah, time, uh, I'm running out of time, so I don't, ask, uh, don't explain the window function stuff. It's complicated, and it still doesn't work. Why it still doesn't work? Because in the window function, we first use the filter to select the data set, uh, all the, uh, the data set from the uh, article tips. And then we do the filtering to get the data set. After that, we can do the partitioning and ordering. After doing the partitioning and ordering, we can define row number R. So R is defined as the row number, which depends on the data set. So we can use R to define the data set because you don't have this row number yet before you have the, before you have the uh, data set in the filter. So we need to put the whole thing into a subquery, get all the rankings of the, of the tips. And then at the out, in the outer query, we filter that out for out less than or equal to five for the top five per article. And the query plan is very complicated. The font size are very small. And it takes nearly five, uh, five seconds to do the whole query because it's doing a sequential scan on tips. Because we are doing things inside the subquery, therefore it can only put everything into the, uh, into the temporary table. And then in the outer query, we do the filtering, filter out 99.95% of them so most of the words are wasted. But wait, what about we do it manually? If we do, say, select all articles from order one, we can see that things are very, very fast, uh, less than three milliseconds, returning less than 500 articles using the index scan. So things are weird because for each article, you take one millisecond. And it takes three milliseconds to get 500 articles. So you should use 500 articles, which is 500 milliseconds, and then plus the three milliseconds, which should be around 500 milliseconds at worst case, but we get five, uh, nearly five seconds. So it's not satisfactory. What if we can do what we do in the first attempt? In the first attempt, you try to use subquery to do so, which doesn't work because subqueries are run independently with the outer queries. What if we can do so? That's where lateral subquery shines. By defining the subquery, you can see that basically the same, except that we define the subquery as a lateral subquery. By using a lateral subquery, we then we can do a subquery which is depending on the outer query, and it certainly works. And it is, to, it is very, very fast. It's only four milliseconds compared to 4,000 something milliseconds. And it's using both the index. It's using the full power of the index. So compared with the window function version, it's much faster. It's no weird window function. And most importantly, it's more natural because we build a simpler version and then we build up on that, expanding that instead of completely different approach by the window function. So that's how, where lateral subqueries shines. And the caution with lateral subqueries is that uh, if you are doing normal subqueries and you are doing full table scan in the inner query and the outer query, then you do two full table scans, say two million rows. And, but if you do it in lateral subqueries, since they're dependent, then you are doing 1 million times 1 million scans, which is 1 billion trillion, which will never end. So you need to use lateral subquery 
with indexes. Use the index, look. By the way, if you don't know, uh, there is a website called, exactly called use the index, look, which tells you, teach you how to use, uh, optimize database performance by using the index. You can go to have a look on them. That's all I have today. Sorry for the overrun. Thank you.